Thank you, Robot Lady. Good evening and welcome to Know Before You Grow, a committee of Petal Petaluma Urban Chat. I'm Dan Like, and as always, thanks to Sharon Kirk, Dave Alden, and the host of other people who make this happen. I'm told that as of today, we have over 760 viewers of some part of our general plan series, either directly during the sessions or later on YouTube. Feels pretty good, but of course, we'd like to reach more people. You can find the past sessions on our website at urbanchat.org. And I know people have had trouble finding some of those. So once again, urbanchat.org. Tomorrow, we'll be meeting at Aquas Cafe at noon. We have no agenda, but we'll probably be continuing the discussion from tonight. And we'll be talking about future programs because we always do. If you'd like to be a part of this silliness, please come out and hang out with us. This evening is one more in our general plan 20 months of forums intended to help Petaluma residents better understand the topics that will be addressed in the general plan update and become better advocates for the land use future they want for our town. Couple quick housekeeping notes. We've been Zoom bombed in the past. We may be in the future. If your screen goes blank, black, hang loose and we'll be back shortly. If I boot you back by accident, please rejoin. We probably have people who are subject to the Brown Act and want to respect the intent of California's public meetings rules. So uh, avoid serial meetings, those of you who are. Uh, thank you to Josh Simmons and Petaluma Civics rebroadcasting this meeting on Twitch and Facebook and YouTube. And with that, I think the uh, session goes over to Dave and I sit in the background and do my usual thing. Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm gonna start off by giving an apology. I had really hoped to have another speaker here this evening. Uh, Chuck Marone of Strong Count and I spoke about it several different times. And ultimately he just could not make it work. He had uh, both professional Strong Count's obligations and family obligations but he's thrilled by what we're doing in Petaluma. He has committed to looking for another place to participate in what we're doing. So uh, tonight you're stuck with me. Uh, what I'm gonna do though is, well, Dan's really gonna do it. He's uh, got them all queued up. We're gonna do a couple of videos, uh, one from Marone Strong Towns Organization and one from Joe Minicozzi of Urban Three. Uh, and then I'll finish up by making a few comments that maybe bring it back a little bit to Petaluma and continue the conversation from there. Let me talk a little bit about Marone and Minicozzi because you will effectively be hearing from them uh, via video. Uh, Chuck's an interesting guy, got an engineering degree, went out and started practicing, and then said, you know, I all these books that tell me exactly what to do, how wide streets should be, how much density there should be, a lot of this doesn't make sense to me, but I have no way to really argue it. I'm just being told to apply the rules. So he went back and became trained as a planner, actually joined AIA and still said, I'm not really getting where I want to. I'm not building the world that I think makes sense. So at that point, he founded Strong Towns, uh, who argues a lot of things about transportation planning, financial planning. Uh, I don't agree with every single thing that Strong Towns stands for. I don't agree with every, every single, single thing that Chuck stands for, but a lot of what he says fits. It aligns well with what Urban Chat is. Uh, I've been exchanging thoughts with him for nearly a decade, um, longtime friends, colleagues, etc. cetera. Uh, and Chuck has a lot of videos online, including one we had now have on the Urban Chat website. So a lot of ways for you to follow up what you begin to learn this evening, continuing on in with your education. Uh, and actually, the video tonight will not be Chuck. It'll be a guy named Jason Slaughter of Not Just Bikes. But he's working under the Strong Towns umbrella, doing videos to take people who maybe are not familiar with Strong Towns and start getting, getting them up to speed. The entire Not Just Bikes series is great. Uh, I'm going to show you number three in the series tonight. But I recommend, if your time permits, you know, some evening when you want to uh, um, watch show after show after show, do it with not just bikes rather than Big Bang Theory. Uh, Minicozzi, a little bit of a different path, uh, architect with degrees out of both Miami and Harvard, uh, became involved in a downtown project in Asheville, North Carolina, realized how important downtown development was, became a proponent of downtown development for the financial reasons, formed a group called Urban Three, which is a for-profit company, but he and Chuck team up a lot. They travel together. Chuck is there to say, 
hey, suburbia doesn't work. And Joe was there to say, yeah, but downtown does. Uh, those of you who've been involved with Urban Chat for a while may remember that we were lucky enough to get uh, Joe here back in September of 2016. Spoke to about 200 people at the Women's Club, had a great evening. Um, and I know he, he's done work in Petaluma, so he is he does have local ties. Let me see. I made some notes for myself here. There we go. Um, just to be clear, you're not going to come away from this evening thinking that Strong Towns and Urban 3 have it dead right. Uh, what they're saying is such a complex subject and so non-intuitive to those of us who grew up in this country that it's going to take a while, but we ho will hopefully get you started on that path and you know, we will help you move along it. We have resources on our site. Uh, there's a lot long ways to go. Lastly, the first video tonight, we'll talk about gro suburban growth, suburban finances as a Ponzi scheme. When I first heard that phrase, I was sort of like, yeah, that's an overstatement. That doesn't really make sense. And over several months, it's sort of like, yeah, it really does. And what, what we do in suburbia is truly a Ponzi scheme. So when you hear it tonight, don't roll your eyes listen to it carefully, think about it, come to our meetings like tomorrow, talk about it. I think you'll eventually realize just how right that description is. With that, uh, Dan, do you wanna start the Not Just Bikes video? Thank you. Welcome to the third video in my Strong Towns series. If you have no idea what Strong Towns is about, you might wanna watch the first two videos, but it's not strictly necessary. American cities are famous for car-dependent sprawl. That's probably one of the first things most people associate with America after apple pie, baseball, and driving in soul-crushing traffic. But this wasn't always the case. American cities don't have to be sprawling just because the country itself is big. And up until the Second World War, they weren't. They were just as compact as cities found almost anywhere else. But after the 1940s, America started on a totally different pattern of development and began their great suburban experiment. But herein lies the problem, because this American pattern of development builds places that do not financially support themselves. And the only reason they're still there is because American cities are a Ponzi scheme. If you don't know what a Ponzi scheme is, there are many videos on YouTube, but the very quick explanation is as follows. A scammer offers an imaginary investment opportunity, offering a huge return on investment. Investor A comes along and invests. Now, the scammer doesn't actually have the money to pay investor A if he wants his money out, so he takes on another investor B. He uses the money from investor B to pay investor A, pocketing a little for himself, of course. But how does he pay investor B? Easy. He just brings on investors C, D, E, and so on. This works out great for our scammer, but the moment that growth stops, he has a very big problem. In the end, all Ponzi schemes fail. It's just a matter of when. One of the key insights of strong towns is that the way that US and Canadian cities have been built since World War II follows exactly this model. American-style suburbia is dependent on growth to stay financially solvent. The moment these cities stop growing, because of a financial crisis, a radical change in the job market, or any one of a number of other factors, everything starts to fall apart. Strong Towns calls this the growth Ponzi scheme. Now, unlike financial fraud, the generation who started this process didn't do it intentionally. After World War II, America was a prosperous country, and with low-cost automobiles available, it seemed possible that every American could own their own house, on their own piece of land, and the American dream was born. This became so central to American psychology that the idea that suburban development provides prosperity is taken as fact by almost everyone in the country. And the same goes for Canada too. Part of the problem is how suburban growth is financed. When the suburbs began, huge amounts of money from federal and state governments were given to cities to build out their suburbs. This still goes on today. For example, when a city wants to build a new road or freeway, usually less than a quarter of the funding comes from the city itself. The overwhelming majority comes from the Department of Transportation and other higher levels of government. So cities don't have to pay very much to build new infrastructure, but they do get a big influx of tax revenue from the new developments that spring up. This brings us to the first problem. 
It encourages cities to build lots of new developments, even if they don't make any financial sense. Of course, all this new cheap infrastructure comes with a very important catch. The city may get it built for cheap, but the city is ultimately responsible for paying to maintain that infrastructure forever. On the surface, this is fine. Governments want to invest in their cities because they are the engines of economic growth. And for the city, this should be fine too. They collect taxes from the new developments that spring up around that infrastructure, and those taxes go towards future maintenance. The big problem begins if there isn't enough tax revenue collected to cover the replacement cost of the infrastructure. And that is exactly what has happened with car-dependent suburbia, because car-centric sprawl is horrendously expensive. To explain this problem further, I'll use the example of a quote, ideal development that is often used as an example by strong towns. Imagine a new suburban housing development on the edge of town. In this case, the developer completely pays for the street and turns it over to the city for maintenance. The residents move in and start paying tax revenue. This couldn't get any better for the suburban municipality. Free development, free road, bunch of new tax revenue, this is awesome. Now the municipality in this case would put a little bit of money aside for the maintenance of that road. So what would this look like in an American suburb? Well at first, streets don't need a lot of maintenance. They may require some minor repairs such as filling cracks, but in general, new streets are pretty cheap. So the suburban city's cash flow looks something like this. Everything looks pretty great until the end of the street's life cycle, because eventually all streets and roads need resurfacing. So suddenly, the graph goes like this. If the city were just this one street, it would already be bankrupt. But cities aren't just one street. They're made up of hundreds of streets and individual developments. So assuming a new development every other year, a real growing city's cash flow would look something like this, with new developments covering the cost of past developments. As you can see, growth covers the problem, and the city is financially solvent again. Yay! This is great! Let's build more! Lots of asphalt and free parking for everyone! But when you get a couple of generations into the suburban experiment, the maintenance obligations of the past start to catch up with you. Suddenly, your suburb's finances start to look something like this. Because when you lose money on every development, you don't make it up in volume. Now, it's important to note that this is an ideal case, as this model assumes near constant growth. In reality, cities have phases of growth and phases of decline, and this situation is made even worse because these growing infrastructure liabilities tend to show up just as a period of growth is over. Many Americans like to brush this off by claiming that cities do actually collect enough tax revenue, but it's all lost to corruption or inefficiencies or unions or whatever. But the reality is that most American suburbs collect only a fraction of the tax revenue required to actually finance their sprawling infrastructure. Strong Towns has several case studies about this, such as this example of a suburban road that needed resurfacing. In order for the residents to cover just the cost of their own road, the city would need an immediate 46% increase in property tax. And there are so many other costs to a city beyond just roads, such as sewer and water systems, sidewalks, treatment systems, pumps, water towers, stormwater ponds, as well as all the operational costs of running a city, such as police or fire departments. You can't just brush this off by waving your hands in the air and saying, The efficiencies, the efficiencies, the efficiencies, the efficiencies. Sorry, worst case scenario, you have no problem with parking taxes? No, it's efficiency. I'll link to this and other cases by Strong Towns in the description. And Canada is not much better. An analysis done by the Halifax Regional Municipality found that the cost to maintain and service an urban home are well less than half that of a suburban home. But in most North American cities, the suburban home pays less property tax. This leads to an effective subsidy for car-dependent suburbia. Now, don't get me wrong, our cities need affordable housing. But the solution is not to subsidize the least efficient, least sustainable developments in the city. But that topic deserves a lot more explanation, so I'll talk about that in more detail in a future video. So it's clear that car-dependent suburbs are not financially sustainable. The amount of tax revenue collected by the suburb does not cover the replacement cost of its infrastructure. And so suburban cities become addicted to growth, 
any kind of growth, even second-rate taco joints, just to bring in enough tax revenue to cover their maintenance obligations. But we've had several generations of this suburban garbage, several life cycles of road, water, and sewer replacements. But somehow, suburbia is still there. So you might be asking yourself, how are car-dependent suburbs still around? Why is this still a thing? And what has kept it afloat all these years? Well, the answer is debt. Lots and lots and lots of debt. But I'll explore that in the next episode of this series on Strong Towns. I'd like to thank my supporters on Patreon who pay me to copy Strong Towns homework. If you'd like to donate to Strong Towns, visit strongtowns.org slash membership. And we will let you watch the rest of that uh, on your own and flip over to this video. I'm Joe Minicozzi, and I'm the director of Urban 3 based in Asheville, North Carolina. We help cities look at land use, urban design, and economics so they can see how they're doing financially and what they can be doing better. What we consistently find is that municipalities and their counties perform better when they invest their dollars in walkable mixed-use development patterns instead of other forms of development like sprawl. Think of a company that consumes raw materials, adds some labor and know-how, and creates a product. This company will need to know the cost of their materials, their labor, revenue, and the ultimate market value of the product in order to see whether they will be successful or not. Cities are actually quite similar. Their raw material is a finite resource, the land within their borders, and their product is their tax base, which is what they need to survive and prosper. We have looked at cities all over the country, and when you do the math, it's easy to see that dense downtown development returns a greater investment to the community than putting tax dollars towards sprawl. Let's look at some examples. My house sits on one-tenth of an acre lot. Our municipal property taxes are about $1,100 a year, or about $11,000 an acre. This big box retailer sits on a 34-acre lot. Its total property taxes are a whopping $221,000 a year, which equates to about $6,500 an acre net to the city. Taking the city's portion of property taxes and adding the estimated retail taxes, it equaled $54,000 in total tax production per acre. That seems like a lot until we compare it to a building downtown. This boarded up department store was converted into a mixed use building site that includes retail, office, and residential space. So where does this mixed use building come in? The city nets a considerable $330,000 in property taxes per acre. Add to it the estimated 83,000 in retail taxes per acre, which brings the total to the city to 413,000 per acre. That's more than seven and a half times the productivity of the big box site. Even looking at jobs, the big box store produces about six jobs per acre, while our mixed use building comes in at 74 jobs per acre. And let's not forget the downtown building also contains 90 residential units per acre. Those residents are working and shopping and creating additional economic activity. The big box store has zero residential units. But remember, most companies need to count more than raw material costs. They also need to account for their labor, management, and know-how. This is the investment they make in turning raw materials into finished product. Cities are the same. In order to turn land into tax base, they have to add a special something called infrastructure. At a minimum, cities add value to their land by providing streets, utility service, police protection, and fire protection. The more spread out a city becomes, the more expensive it is to deliver those services, especially when that acre of land pays less per acre. Unfortunately, when cities consider new developments, too often they focus on taxes that they hope will flow to the city coffers without adequately considering the land base they will use up or the costs they will incur. In city after city, big and small, when we do the math, it's clear that dense downtown development is much more productive than anything else in the community. Downtown development is the golden goose of urban economics, and it's the best bet for cities that want to prosper in the long run. Dave, are you there? I am there. I'm right. trying to get it to show. There we go. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Let me see. Do this. Oh.
Okay, I'm going to try to bring this back to Petaluma, you know, not specifically, I don't claim to be an expert on the budget. Uh, we have at least one council member here, so I certainly don't want to step on their toes. But I, I want to bring it back to the extent I can uh, locally. The bottom line of really what both uh, Strong Towns and Minicozi say is that cities, in order to be sustainable financially in the long term, have to have enough private property, paying property taxes, to support the public infrastructure. You know, not just for one year, but over 40 years, 50 years, 75 years. What does that really mean? Let's imagine a new project. Uh, we'll call it mixed use, my personal favorite. On one side of the equation, you have the developer's investment in housing, retail space, offices, parking, et cetera. A lot of dollars. On the other side, he does public improvements, typically required through the uh, approval process. Streets, water, and more. Uh, could be a lot of different things, a park, uh, maybe even a small library. Uh, and what he does on the left, he or she does on the left, has to be sufficient, has to generate sufficient taxes to pay for what's on the right. You know, or looking at it from the perspective of City Hall, private land and buildings paying property taxes have to generate enough dollars to cover the costs of the infrastructure and whatever else you're trying to maintain with property taxes. Now, from that basis, uh, I had a really interesting conversation once in an Irish pub in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I know that sounds like the first line of a country western song, it's really not. It was a couple of young planners and public works folks out of a town called Bate, Texas. And they had come up with the idea that you can define a ratio of private investment to public infrastructure maintenance needs. And if your project exceeds that ratio, then the project is financially sustainable and they should only approve projects that meet that standard. How does that apply to Petaluma? I did some calculations and admittedly they are back of the envelope. I could sit down with Peggy Flynn, Corey Gabarolio, and they could tear holes in my numbers, but for rough orders of magnitude, I think I'm in the ballpark. And that is there needs to be $35 of private property tax paying investment for every $1 of infrastructure in order for a town to be financially sustainable. At first blush, that may seem extreme. How can it possibly be that way? But remember, in, in California, in Petaluma, if there's $35 of property value under Prop 13, we only pay about 35 cents of even that in property taxes. And then under Prop 13, Petaluma gets only 11% of that. So if there's 35, so in a typical year, that $35 of property would pay 35 cents in property taxes, and Petaluma gets about four cents. Out of that four cents, they need to pay for public safety, parks, all the other things City Hall does, planning, etc. If you can spend more than a penny of that four cents on infrastructure maintenance, you're doing well. So you're getting one penny a year to maintain a dollar of public infrastructure. That barely gets you there. So I'm, I'm comfortable the $35 number is right and maybe even a little optimistic. So I know those numbers go by quickly. If you want to question me later, I'll be here. So what the different kinds of development looks like look like in terms of how many dollars or how, how much private investment, private property, property tax paying dollars can be supported for a dollar of infrastructure. This is a home that, by my calculation, is about a 12 to 1 ratio. Uh, it, you're only getting $12 of property tax assessment for every $1 of infrastructure. Horribly financially unsustainable. Uh, and I should stop for a moment and talk a little bit about where this house is. I, I made a point in this presentation not to show anything from Petaluma. I didn't want anybody going, hold on, that's my house, why are you making fun of me? So almost all of my photos are from Buffalo, New York. I know, I, I love downtown Buffalo in May and June, don't wanna be there in January, but those, they were the pictures I had. This picture though is actually the home from which I went to high school. 
Uh, my mother lived there till six years ago. I celebrated 50 years of Christmases in that house, sipping eggnog while sa sapping away the economic vitality of Sacramento County. So that's a dark side of my past. Looking at other alternatives, now we'll move over to Buffalo. Great neighborhood, love those homes, could see living there. We're still only 20 to one based on not necessarily Buffalo's property tax approach, but what Petaluma in California does under Jarvis Gann, et cetera. That only reached a ratio of 20 to one when you need 35 to one to be financially sustainable. Moving further down the street, now we're getting close to 35 to one. Three to four stories, maybe still some of them are single homes, others have likely been divided into apartments and apartments just because the multiple kitchens, bathrooms, et cetera, have more property tax per square foot. Uh, they are better for city sustainability, but this is the kind of development that pays for itself under Prop 13. Moving further down the street, terrible street frontage, not a fun place to walk, but the density is there. All apartments, 45 to one, this is very sustainable. If you, if you look around Petaluma, I'm not sure you can find a project like this, uh, although the Northward Apartments going up now will be close. Haystack, if they can find a way through their financial situation will be close. Those are the kind of things we need to be a financially sustainable community. And then ultimately, still Buffalo, and I know it looks like Moscow, but truly it is Buffalo. Um, that's about 100 to 1. That, that pays for itself. That pays for a lot of the single family stuff that I showed at the first slide. This is the golden goose for cities. Uh, probably the closest thing we've had to that in Petaluma would have been the Heinz Project, which unfortunately did not proceed. Not going to argue that point. There were good reasons, I know, for the council not to support it. Uh, but you know that's that's where we have to go. Now, just one last comment, and then I'll let everyone take a short break. Uh, you heard Jason Slaughter from not, not Just Bikes talk about we claim you know a lot of people want to claim that cities are inefficient. That's the reason we can't be financially sustainable. You know, heck, if you read the letters to the editor in the Argus Courier, you hear that argument made once or twice every month. But let me show you a table. There we go. The Organization of Economic Coordination and Development, 33 of the leading what we might often call first world countries uh, on tax burden as a percent of GDP. If you look down to the bottom, US is one of the lowest tax burdens. And that's not just local, that's local, state, federal, the whole bit, but it, it gives us a hint of where we are in terms of taxing ourselves. And we always hear about, we have the highest taxes in the world. No, we don't. We are actually near the bottom. And that's even tougher to swallow when you realize that the US has the most sprawl in the world and the most expensive military. We, you know, we put out a military that's what, bigger than the next five countries combined. So we're supporting all of that still with a low tax rate and wondering why we have potholes. Uh, it just doesn't really make sense. And you've seen that development patterns that le help lead to that. So with that, I'm just going to say it comes back to summing it up with the first law of holes. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. We have built development for 70 years since World War II. It doesn't work. It's not the only reason this country has financial problems and this city has financial problems, but it's a big part of it. And if we want to be part of a solution going forward, it's supporting a kind of development that isn't what got us into the hole that we've dug. With that, um, what we typically do at this point before we do doing Q&A is take about a two minute break. Uh, the thought is those of you who need to slip away quietly and go put kids to bed, whatever. If you want to read them a book, take something from Strong Towns in. Might as well get starting getting on the right foot early on or whatever reason you need to go do something else. Um, do that in about two minutes, we'll reconvene, we'll start doing Q&A. And for those of you who don't come back, hope you all do. For those of you who don't, thanks for being here. Thank you, Dave. Um, you might want to stop sharing so that as we start the discussion again, we can get back to seeing people's faces unless you have additional content for that. I do not. Okay, and I have been more remarkably remiss in checking the chat here, but we have absolutely no chat so 
Well, anybody Either people who wants are to... really wrapped or they're doing something else. Well, we, we can go at this a lot of ways. Uh, if you want to raise your digital hand, please do so. If you want to make your video live and wave your hand at me, we can do that. Um, there we go. If you want to put something in the chat, we can do that. But again, we're still taking that two minute break before we reconvene. So I'm not going to panic yet about the lack of questions. Or maybe I should just assume that I did such a great presentation. There are no questions and that's okay, okay. too. Well, I, I see a hand, so we're getting, getting ah, somewhere here. Okay, well, again, we'll give it another minute or so to let everybody come back who I encourage to step away. Okay. I'm, uh, I forgot to check the time when you started, so it's time keeping's on you. <laughs> 701, 702. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, for the break. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I was within 15 seconds or so of seven o'clock for starting. So, yeah, I, okay. N not that I'm anal about such things or anything. Well, <laughs> ah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, let's, let's call that two minutes. I think it's pretty okay. close. And Taryn's question, I see your hand raised and perhaps she's in chat also. In chat says, it's just to recap my request, my QST that is. Taryn, you want to pipe up and tell us what you mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry, you guys. This is great and I'm wrapping my head around it, but I missed the first five minutes and that's on really terrible. I apologize. Um, but is this every every town or is it a town above or below a certain population level and and um just so i can frame it and then how the heck did we ever build if our infrastructure if we didn't have enough money thank you sorry to be late i would say smaller towns i mean this is going to be a really rough guess but when you get to cities below two hundred thousand, you start seeing this problem that strong towns have identified just because a bigger city a denser city san francisco uh because they didn't have that much land had to build three and four story buildings that were financially sustainable they may not have realized how flawed single family development was but they were just forced by their reality into doing something that was financially sustainable and i'm sorry taryn you had another question and i've drawn a drawn a blank now could you repeat that um, oh, how, how did we build it in the first think, place? Thank you. Well, if we ask the developer to build the infrastructure and he then builds the homes, why would we not ask him to do that? It's only 25 years down the road when it becomes a financially unsustainable model. Um, so probably in 1950, when we first started doing this, nobody really saw the problem. Beginning somewhere in the 80s, 90s, we started seeing it, strong towns being one of the leaders in that field, but still there's just a small group of us going, hey folks, this doesn't work. We're all gonna go bankrupt someday. And now we've gotten to the point where we are starting to go bankrupt. So the reason we did it was they didn't know better, except when we started knowing better, we still somehow managed to keep doing it. And I think it's also important to capture the, that in the 40s and 50s, in the post-war boom, there were tremendous uh, structures at the federal level trying to create sprawl because people didn't know any better. And so there was an awful lot of structuring of tax dollars, structuring of financing incentives, uh, structuring of mortgage abilities that created the current environment that we're trying to re recover from fiscally. Yeah. And the other point I add is up till 1978 in California, we had a property tax system where whatever a city had to spend to maintain infrastructure and provide all its other services, you just rolled that into your property tax bill and you got billed for exactly that amount. Sort of by definition, cities were financially sustainable and then Prop 13 broke that. It's sort of no matter, no matter what you have to spend, you only get this many dollars. And that's really where we started going downhill. Teddy asks, Dave, can you explain more what, one more time what the 35 to one ratio means? <laughs> okay. You know, it's funny, even this afternoon trying to prepare my notes, I kept tripping myself up. If you have 
$350,000 of taxable property, a $355,000 home, that mythical beast. That home can support about $10,000 of infrastructure. And just for the record, a typical home probably has $30,000 of infrastructure supporting it. You know, just what you have in the street in front of your house, curb, sidewalk, pipes under the street, all that is perhaps 12,000. But then you have your, your share of the waste water treatment plant, the parks, uh, what we pay to Sonoma County Water Agency to deliver water to us, all of that adds up. So unless you have enough property value to justify $30,000 of infrastructure, which would be a, over a million dollar home, it is financially unsustainable. Teddy, did that help? And if it didn't, talk to me because I'm I struggle with it myself. And I believe that that's also impacted by Prop 13, such that that's the the thirty thirty thousand dollars of uh, infrastructure necessary supports the home is a million dollars in purchase price. And if somebody bought that house thirty years ago, yep. we're not getting taxes on that. When I did the 35 to one estimate, I assumed Prop 13, 1% cap. Just a day or two ago, I saw someplace that the average property tax bill is about seven tenths of a percent. So it's down by 30% because of the annual limitation in how much your property tax bill can go up. So, you know, I could probably argue that 35 to one should actually be something closer to 45 to one. Uh, Bill Wolpert types in the chat, if the long-term financial unsustainability of certain land use patterns is now understood, why do cities <laughs> permit them? Uh, Bill, thank you for asking. I know you and I have had this conversation many times. And the answer is it's not understood. Uh, probably for 90% of the folks out there, they still would be surprised by this conversation this evening. Thanks to those of you who are here tonight, you know, taking the step in the right direction. Um, and even if they did understand it, it's sort of like, okay, what we're doing is a bad idea, but there's so much of the bad idea already built up and I'm dealing with that. If I do it again, all I'm doing is taking money out of the pocket of my grandkids. And as much as personally, I don't think we should be taking money out of the pocket of our grandkids. A lot of folks are still willing to do that to get the next subdivision today. Um, and then the other thing is in some ways, this whole conversation has become moot because as much as I believe in this argument that we should be financially sustainable, I believe that the even more important imperative on our cities today is climate action. And development, a development pattern that is appropriate climate action is almost the identical same development pattern as is financially sustainable. So if we do the right thing from a climate perspective, and hopefully we will do so, then we start addressing the financial thing just as an added bonus, which is seriously cool. My understanding too, is that even though impact fees are supposed to be simply support the development which is being built, there are ways to stretch the definition of what that is such that when a developer comes in and offers all sorts of impact fees, that's the revenue stream that the city sees. And that creates a further dig into this uh, into this Ponzi scheme because it's an opportunity for quick, easy cash that makes things solvent right now and damn the down the road problem. I think it was Chuck Marone who described impact fees as the crack cocaine of land development. And I, I don't disagree with that. They, it really bothers me because you're right. Taking impact fees now, spending them now on something, even if it's desirable, and thereby accepting a project that's going to leave a huge negative cash flow 30 years in the future is just, to me, morally repugnant. Um, in fact, I, I would even say that, and state law does permit this, you can have lower impact fees on certain kinds of property. TOD is really where they focus, but TOD tends to be financially sustainable because it's multi-story apartments, et cetera. Um, well, having lower impact fees on projects that are financially sustainable into the indefinite future is something I strongly support and have argued for it for decades, for decade. And I have a private clarification message of informing me that developers don't offer impact fees. 
And yes, my terminology or my wording was probably <laughs> wrong. And thank you for the correction. You, you are correct. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Taryn asks, how do sales tax fees, bonds, and added property tax bills fit in? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again, Dan. How do sales tax fees and bonds and added property tax bills fit in? Well, I mean, I, I assume by added property tax bills, we're talking about... Um, parcel taxes, I'd guess. Pa parcel taxes, well, parcel a little assessments. I mean, they help. You know, it tends to be, you know, those tend to be in the dime per dollar range compared to regular property taxes. So it's a good thing. I'm glad they happen. But I think a more fundamental revisiting of what our property taxes are would be even more appropriate. Uh, and then sales tax. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. Uh, if you have a strong retail business on a small piece of property, uh, you know, the, the big box isn't going isn't to help you here. But a really productive downtown retail with less even residential above, it covers by by the the portion of the proper of the sales tax the city gets that covers some of the deficit that might be occurring on its property taxes, or it makes it even a more productive um, part of the community than it would be without without sales taxes. So it, it helps. It isn't a panacea. Thanks. I was thinking about like Measure U and the yeah. money that we get from that. Thanks. It's yeah. Measure U is great. I'm thrilled we passed it. I truly told Councilmember McDonald that was never going to pass, and I probably stole him a beer for that one. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled <laughs> we passed it, but it doesn't come anywhere close to dealing with our underlying deficit. I, don't know, I think you, you're going to start hearing some complaints in the near future that City Hall isn't accomplishing as much with Proposition U as people had hoped, but legitimately they're doing all they can, and I I trust their efforts. Ben Peters goes near and dear to my heart by asking, what about higher gas taxes or mileage base to cover road costs? As it seems road replacement is the biggest infrastructure cost. Yeah. And I So mind if I drop in there for no, a moment? Go for it, Dan, please. Um, one of the challenges, I, I am a huge fan of vehicle mileage taxes because vehicle mileage taxes not only let you recover for the actual use of the road, if you're willing to base them on time, uh, you can also charge for congestion so that you can actually make an economic case for when you need to add an extra lane to say 101, um, rather than simply adding a lane and inducing additional traffic on there because the only real cost people pay for traffic is the time they spend in their cars. The mileage, the cost we pay per mile in terms of gas taxes and other registration fees doesn't nearly cover the, it isn't enough of an impact on to impact uh, automobile use. But the other problem that we also need to deal with is that currently a couple of economists, bunch of economists seem think that the external costs of an automobile right now are running about 30 cents per mile. Um, and a lot of that isn't necessarily just the cost of infrastructure. That's also in health costs. That's in microplastics that we're introducing into the environment. That's in pollution, which results in lower, uh, lower lifespans, lower quality of life near the freeway. So one of the things to have a gas tax that actually is meaningful and starts to cover those things means that it needs to be about 10 times what it is right now. And uh, to have a vehicle mileage tax, which would be fantastic in, from my point of view, we also need to make that dependent on what kind of vehicle it is. And we need to have the political will to say, no, if you've got a big high nosed vehicle, which kills pedestrians, we need to tax that appropriately. So there's a lot of political will that needs to be addressed there. I, I would just add one thing to that, Dan. What you said, I agree with completely. I don't think we need a VMT in lieu of a gas tax. We need both. We need a VMT that addresses the impacts of you know, mileage in general, of driving through a downtown at, at uh, rush hour, and whatever else, you know, tire wear, et cetera. And then we need a gas tax to address the external costs of using of burning gasoline. You know, right now, we think if we tax gas enough to pay for the roads, We've done something good. 
And that's nonsense. Gas has such huge geopolitical expenses, has environmental expenses. And right now, we're make, putting that into the general fund to the extent we put it anywhere. Uh, years ago, I came across a study, very academic, um, that said even then gas should be priced anywhere from 12 to $15 a gallon. And that's to cover all those costs. And that was a decade ago. You know, we probably need a VMT today that is coming up on 30 cents a mile. And then I, and we charge for gas another $20 per gallon for gas. I mean, that would just destroy our economy tomorrow. Uh, but we need to start working that direction. It's the only way we're going, only way we're going to dig out of some of these holes. So uh, Teddy Herzog asks, can we say that roughly one story structures lose money for the city and uh, mixed used four story buildings probably pay for themselves downtown? Density pays for itself long term and low density sprawl does not, correct? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, Nancy Frank says, this is the first community I've lived in that does not have a transfer tax on sale of properties. I gathered that it was considered in the past and not adopted. Does anyone know the history on that? It's a great revenue stream. I'm not sure I'm the expert here, but I don't hear anybody else opening up. So um, it was considered uh, in the run up to Prop U and it, it could come back again. I know uh, the mayor has probably been the lead, leading proponent of it. Uh, it is, it's a good, it's a good tax, a good reasonable tax. It, it doesn't add all that much uh, to the bottom line. I, I would support it, but it's not going to be a panacea. And Nancy and I, I know you and I have talked before. In fact, I probably owe you an email on this. And you say other communities have transfer taxes and look to be in better financial shape. One thing to understand about Petaluma is because of the way Prop 13 was written, we get a much smaller share of our property tax dollars than other cities do. So sometimes when we look at other cities and say, you know, say they, they look to be doing better in Petaluma, we have to maybe look at what they get from Prop 13 compared to what we get. It may not be the transfer tax that's the difference. It may be the way Prop 13 was applied to that other city compared to us. So I, I'm just speculating at this point, but th th there is some reality there. Um, Steve Bertelbaugh observes that we also give oil companies tax breaks to induce them to search for oil. Um, we can also make arguments <laughs> that a good portion of the military budget is subsidy of oil prices and all sorts of other, yes, there's lots of economic stuff there. I want to kind of stay local. Uh, no, um, I, no, but I, I love Steve's point. And Steve, I'm, thanks for being here. Always good to see people from Santa Rosa joining in. Uh, Mary Dooley says the current impact fees are a barrier to small scale mixed use buildings, which would restore our downtown core's vitality. I'm concerned that a larger apartment complex that Dave shared from Buffalo, although it may have a better economic ratio, is only for large scale developers. How can we work towards a reduction in impact fees to open up smaller properties to develop as mixed use and entry level home, owner, home ownership? I can talk really. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd probably say, you know, yes, I know it would apply to the, to the big Moscow style building also, but I would say anything that is going to provide more tax revenue than needed to support its infrastructure should be getting a reduced impact fee, whether it's a tiny building or a big building. I mean, yes, I, I would love to see more fine grained development in town. I absolutely support that. I'm not sure impact fees are the way to get there. We might wanna get there through more of a planning entitlement approach, uh, but lower impact fees on good development is something we should do regardless of size. Karen asks, any thoughts on the quality of life, health and spiritual costs of conforming to apartment block living? My life would be profoundly lacking without my garden. I have some thoughts on this, but you take it first, Dave, if you uh, want to. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take a run at it. Hey, I agree with you. I mean, some people really like single family lifestyle. I personally, I'm 68. I live in a single family home now. My wife and I are talking about the fact that five years from now, we want to be in a downtown apartment where we can walk. And that's just, that's our life choice. People who want to live in single family housing, okay, your choice. But I would like to see property taxes to be adjusted, where if you live in a place that is not financially sustainable, you pay a higher property tax. I think that's just fair. I just, you know, my 13th great ancestors were pilgrims. I, I've got those Puritan roots. And I still feel that I, sh I should pay for what I use. And I hope other people feel something similar. 
And you know, somebody took me to task for um, <laughs> having a car on next door today. And uh, it's fair. Um, and I, I too think that there, first, there are ways to build communal structures that support people's need to get their hands dirty. Um, there are community gardens. There are ways to say, put that dense property up and make some, make parkland around it, make, uh, make ways for us to impact less land and still have the use of that land. Um, and I echo Dave's comments about let's also people like me who have certain lifestyle choices, let's make sure that we're paying for the, that and we're making the trade off consciously rather than simply living off the subsidies. Well, th th this isn't necessarily maybe the way Terrence talking about getting your hands dirty, but I've been working with the intended developer of the 890 co-op project on the North Boulevard. We've now submitted application to the city. We'll be talking with um, Heather and the project planner next week. It has an effective density of about 20 units per acre. It may not be quite financially sustainable, but it's really close to it. And yet it still includes a fairly elaborate wood shop on site that all the residents get to use. I know, yes, sawdust is different than getting mud on your hands, but still for people who enjoy doing something physically, he's included, the developer has included that in the project and that's great. I'm thrilled by that. Let's see. Um, we have a couple of private messages to me <laughs> <laughs> and I will assume that the uh, author of them wishes to remain somewhat anonymous. <laughs> Okay. And these are probably not questions that you and I can answer, Dave. They're probably questions for the floor. Um, but they are, why is the Washington Commons uh, stalled? And why are the Liberty and Washington building stalled? And why are the Ellis apartments st stalled? Um, well, actually, the architect on one of those projects is part of the room here. I don't know if she wants to speak. And then the other comment is that we are, we clearly as a, in the state, need to get ourselves out from under the yoke of Prop 13. And boy, I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, I, Mary's got a hand up. Oh, she, Mary, well, was that hand intentional? I think that uh, I heard Liberty Street when... <laughs> you did. <laughs> I think that's what I heard. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Mad Architecture is are the architects for that property on Liberty across the street from uh, Sachs. And um, essentially the project, it's 10, it's 10, uh, I guess we'd call them not really townhouses, but there's 10 dwellings and a small uh, commercial space. There's accessible dwellings as well as uh, multi-story uh, dwellings. And um, it's completely permitted, but the cost to build it is is really stalling the project. And so the the property owners decided to put it on the market. Um, and this is one of those projects where um, the impact fees are part of it. Some of the infrastructure fees are part of it. And of course, people might know that lumber is out, you know, just through the roof in terms of uh, costs. So it's a challenge when you're a smaller developer wanting to do a small project. So we need a project like this. It's a great project, but um, it, it's, it's difficult when you're not a big, you know, like a larger corporation like Spanos. I don't know if that answers that one. I've talked occasionally to the architect for the uh, Ellis or the El yeah, Ellis project and also the Washington Commons project and his story is very similar. And actually I've been in communication even earlier this week with the developer of the Haystack project. You know, he, he would probably describe his problem a little differently. Clearly he's not a small developer, he's a larger one, but he tried, they tried to, to come up with a project that had a lot of great community amenities to it. Uh, retail space, parks that would be fun for the public to wander through, and it became a project they couldn't afford. Uh, you may see a story in tomorrow's Argus implying that project is close to dead. I don't think that's really the case. Uh, they have 
submitted some new conceptual thoughts back to the city to see if they can find a way to reconfigure it and make it work. I don't like the project as much as what I saw before, but I would I am supportive of them looking for a way to bring get that project to fruition. There's some additional conversation about uh, yeah, not I don't think anything that's tying specifically into a question in the chat. Um, we might have hit that lull in the conversation in just under an hour. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would reiterate once again, we're meeting tomorrow for lunch at Aquas Cafe. Um, I don't know how we're thinking about whether we're going to go back to in-person. I don't know when we feel comfortable with that. So I think we'll continue on Zoom for a while. Oh, we think... We're not totally sure, check this space, but we think we're going to have a meeting next Thursday um, talking about transportation, I believe. Yeah, correct. Uh, so um, put next Thursday tentatively on your calendar, but if you don't see us here, don't stress too badly. No Is that Thursday or, or I thought we were on. Oh, oh. Wednesday, sorry, Wednesday. <laughs> Thursday is my square dance group, my bad. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would make I would make one comment about sure. our our thoughts about this is going back to the subject. And I'm not quite sure how to how to articulate this, but we've gotten so far away from um, paying for what's common for all of us, and I think even the notion that some people should pay more for a certain lifestyle is maybe part of the problem because we separate ourselves too much. And I'm not quite sure where to, where to go with that, but I, but I feel like um, we should be paying higher taxes to sustain our cities, but we could, we could also distribute that fairly. And that would, that would be a acknowledgement of what's common to us all or for us all. Anyway, um, I'd have to explore that some more to think about it, but I, but I think that, that uh, that's a slippery slope to say, I only want to pay for what I use because then who pays for schools and who, you know, it's, it's, it's a dangerous um, precedent. I agree with you, Sharon. I think, I think there's a lot of ground we can go through uh, in that conversation. And I'm always happy to have those conversations. I, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, yeah, so my point was just, if we say, you know, if we say that that single family home should pay more because they're not using the land well, well, then they could argue, well, then I don't need to pay for schools because I don't have kids. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it, uh, <laughs> it opens yeah, there. The yeah, there are, there are perverse incentives and there are things that, um, that genuinely benefit everybody. Right. And, and, I, and I think we need to be we, we, I, I just think we need to think differently about what we do for each other. Yes, yeah. teasing those things apart is is useful. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm comfortable saying that I think we all benefit from having good schools. We're, we're creating a next generation of educated youth that make a difference. I, I don't see that same kind of benefit in somebody choosing to chew up an acre of land for a home. But again, uh, I yeah, but I've I've spoken a lot of gray hairs. With, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I've I've spoken with people who don't have kids, will never have kids, and don't want to pay for schools. And even though there is a benefit, I mean, you know, who's going to be taking care of you when you're old? It's going to be either someone who's well educated or someone who's a dunderhead. So, you know, I, I, I agree completely. I, I don't have kids. We'll never have kids. I've never voted against a school tax. So, we're out here also. Well, I, I, yeah, no, yeah. I, I get that. I just think it's. I, I just think that we should talk about what's what's the vision for our common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well, with that, shall we uh, say uh, good night until next week or tomorrow if you all want to join us then? Sounds good. Thank cool. you so much, Dave. Hey, thanks for everything you and Dan do and freely for all of you for being here tonight. Thank you. Great. You make it worthwhile. Have a good evening, all. Good night. <laughs>